So welcome, John. Thank you. And uh, over to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for that welcome. Um, I'll just talk a bit while we let these people sit down and get comfortable. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming, especially so late in the afternoon. Really appreciate you all being here. Uh, and, you know, also thanks to the organisers for putting me on the bill as well. Um, Agile on the Beach was my first ever Agile conference, and I remember sort of sitting right at the back being very timid, scared to ask a question, scared to introduce myself to strangers, scared to talk to the people I even know, and now here I am. I mean, it's exactly the same, but here I am. So it always means a lot. So thank you for having me here. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, a thing called solution-focused coaching. Uh, hopefully it's not too heavy, right? Uh, what I'd love you to do is just take away the spirit of the essence of this talk, right? Uh, so don't stress yourself by trying to put it all in your brain. Uh, I am quite prone to talking quite fast. Sorry about that. Um, questions at the end, if there's time, because it could be a mic drop situation. I'll introduce myself properly first. Uh, so as I said, my name's John. Uh, I'm predominantly a coach. Uh, I'm described in various ways. Uh, agile is normally in them. Executive coach is sometimes in it, where executive is more about the non-directive nature of what I do rather than seniority. Uh, I do a bit of agile consultancy as well. Uh, I love to hike. I love wearing silly hats. Uh, I have some badges. I've studied hard to uh, understand coaching and get better at it. It's a lifelong journey, but I'm uh, thoroughly enjoying it. I live in Bristol with uh, a lovely family, uh, a lot of ukuleles, and a psychotic cat. Um, oh, I'm an independent person as well, so if anyone's interested in having more conversations about this, I'm available for workshops and chats and coaching and, and anything, really. Um, I don't do potted stuff, so come and have a chat and we'll see if what I offer might match what you want. We'll do a discovery and so forth. You should always start with why, I'm told. So there is the why. That bit is done. Uh, if you want to put a bit more on it, this is what I think might be in it for you. And this is certainly what was in it for me, right? Uh, as a conversation style, as a way of thinking, Solution Focus helps you to get unstuck if you find yourself thinking about lots of things. If you're dwelling, uh, it helps you to make the meetings more effective. What I'm about to share with you works for one-to-one -one conversations, group conversations, and astonishingly organization-level conversations. It's not a silver bullet, it doesn't do everything, but judiciously applied, it can help with those, help you find a sense of direction, I hope, uh, make more progress towards your goals, and if you don't know what your goals are, to find them and feel them, uh, and to notice more opportunities and more possibilities. This is why I care about it. Um, for me, it was as radical as, uh, you know, discovering things like Agile, discovering uh, things like Kinefin, all of that kind of stuff. It just makes you think differently. Um, where might you apply it? So I appreciate not everyone in the room is a one-to-one -one coach who sort of spends 90 minutes to two hours thinking deeply and has quality thinking time with one person. You may well be just having quick conversations in your teams or as a leader with a coaching style, you may want to get better at uh, helping the people that come and talk to you. You know all those dreaded, have you got a minute moments? And everyone, I can see everyone's just going, <laughs> so it helps in those, right? These are coaching moments. These are uh, opportunities for using coaching as a leadership style. Uh, you can apply it there. Um, team and group work and organization design, as I said, and leading yourself, right? Uh, if you sense you're stuck or want to feel different about something, you can maybe try and apply some of the thinking styles that I'm going to offer you today. The other thing that's really important to stress is it works with what you're doing now. So if you already have a favorite process, if you already have a favorite way of thinking about coaching, it should be compatible. Um, you don't need to buy anything. There's no certification, certification required. Sorry. Uh, I am standing on the shoulders of giants, as usual. So solution focus actually comes out of a therapeutic method, which is a brief therapeutic method, which has proven to be very successful uh, and very effective for uh, the people who wanted to work with it. Uh, Paul Z. Jackson and uh, Mark McCurgo then um, sort of wrote up a set of guidelines for using it for coaching, and particularly in business. You know, this is the best book I know about on the subject. And the main thing that we're going to talk about today, uh, the simple mnemonic, comes from that. There are 
uh, a set of tools that we use, and there is a coaching process too. A coaching process is a way to orchestrate or facilitate a thinking session to get good outcomes for the person you're thinking with. I'm sure you're familiar with things like Grow, for example. Great. So this works with Grow too. The thing I would invite you to do today, though, is to really think about how to be and the sort of stance of uh, a solution-focused coach and therefore how that might affect how you would like to think and how you would like to be when you're in these conversations. And that's why I hope it's not too heavy, because it's almost stylistic rather than process-based. So, solution-focused. I hope I've convinced you it's a useful way to invest your time this afternoon. But what on earth is it? Well, there's just one problem that I have with it. Uh, you know, and bear in mind, it's got all of this academic information behind it, lots of learned people. It's been going for 30, 40 years. Uh, and that's the name. The name is not mine. As I said, it's not mine. Someone else says, I don't think it's about solutions. I actually think it's more about direction. And this is why this talk doesn't get into a lot of conferences, is because of the word solution, right? We hate solutions. We assume it's jumping to solutions. We assume it's anchoring on solutions. But really, uh, what they mean here is solutions as in ways forward. And direction is incredibly important in that. If you have a direction, you can work out what's useful to get there and how to go there. So the first addition I would make is to change it to choosing a direction with focus. Um, and, you know, it's rare to have an opportunity to rant, really, and I really appreciate the <laughs> nods and that, and that everyone's kind of gone along with me. So if you don't mind, I'll just do one more. The second part of the name, focus. Oops, I've done that already. So choosing a direction with focus. I'm not fond of focus either. Sorry, all those academics. Uh, I think it's about choosing a direction and doing things that will help you go towards it. So focus or over-focusing can speak to being blinkered and only seeing things that will help you with one specific thing. I call these penicillin moments, right? I'm sure you're aware that penicillin was discovered by accident, essentially. Someone had the awareness uh, and the curiosity to notice that something unexpected had happened in their lab, right? That is kind of the opposite of this myopic focus, blinkered focus. So what we're looking for then is an awareness of what might work, an experimentation attitude to find things. So welcome to my talk then. It is called Choosing a Direction, Noticing, Thinking and Doing Things that Will Help You Go Towards It. And it's pronounced... <laughs> so, tell everyone about it. It's going to be huge. <laughs> this is a serious point, right? Please don't be deterred by the name of it, right? There's a lot more underneath it. Uh, including doing it until you decide not to, right? Because, again, change your focus, pivot, go and do something more useful to you. A couple of key principles in what we do, uh, uh, totally aligned with Agile, right? Find what works, do more of it. Amplify what's going well, do more of that, okay? Um, the other one is that people already have the resources they need to change. Quite often when we want to change or we're thinking about change in organizations and teams, we tend to view folk as being deficient or needing development or lacking something. And, you know, my invite to you is to think about people as a whole who have what they need uh, and that they can capitalize on it. So we don't try and fix. We don't come in with the perception that people are broken in some way. They may briefly be holding on to uh, something, some issue, but it's not all of them. It's not personalized and it doesn't define them, right? So it's very much a position that the expert in a situation is the person. And even if they don't know how to do a thing, they have the means to discover it. They have the means to fill in gaps and know where to go next. The other thing that's important, uh, do we have any horseshoe crab fans in the audience? <laughs> yes, awesome. <laughs> so horseshoe crabs, right, they've not evolved for something like 450 million years. There's been no evolutionary pressure for them to do so. This is the conversation I imagine they have every day. And you may work with people like this. It's really important to know, before you do any of this, that you have what we call a customer for change. And you can ask people. You can elicit that and find out where they're at. And then you can work out whether it's even time for a coaching conversation. Okay? So apply these things judiciously. Think about your situation. So let's get back to how we want to be then. This is the acronym from the book, super valuable. Uh, 
It is, in fact, what we might term a backronym, I suspect, because they also wanted it to be simple. They wanted it to be simple to use, easy to use. So, welcome to my childhood, broken down in laybys. Uh, what do we think is the problem in this picture? <coughs> I'm sorry? We don't know. Damn, you're good. <laughs> do we have any naive and not quite so good answers? <laughs> to the Indian, great, thank you, person I placed in the audience earlier. <laughs> any more offers on what the problem is? Maybe They've lost something, nice. They're just taking a picture. They're taking a picture, so there isn't a problem, but it looks like there is to us. Nice. Any more? Another passenger scarf over Another lost passenger, errant passenger, yeah. That's plucked out of teamwork for sure. Okay. So the thing is, we don't really know what the problem is here, right? We can guess it's the engine, uh, and let's pre pretend it is for a minute. But the problem may not be directly related to the solution in coaching terms. And in particular, the amount of time they've had the problem, the amount of time they've been sat in the lay-by, uh, may not be related to how long it takes to find a solution. So in solution focus, when we talk about the difference between solutions and problems, what we really are interested in is what are these folk looking for, right? So we've already had an offer that they're looking for a lost person. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, you know, they might be looking to get home, and so things like taxis, the AA, um, all of those options come in. They might just live just over the hill, and they might just walk over there. But, you know, equally, I have a friend who has a car not dissimilar to this. Uh, he does these sort of reliability challenges. And so actually, the solution for him is to learn how to fix that car. So. The solution and the problem are often not as tightly coupled as we think. And that's the first thing I'd encourage you to bring into your conversations. You want to find out where people want to go, find out what solutions they're interested in, rather than talking about the problem. There's an old saying that essentially if we... Uh, actually, it could be on the next slide. Let's have a look. Awesome. So, <laughs> the attention goes... You know, your attention goes to... You, you'll get what you pay attention to, essentially. And so, if you talk about problems, you'll become an expert in problems, potentially. If you talk about solutions and what, what's wanted, put your energy into that, you know, that's where you'll go. So, in your retro, I wonder, if you think about the proportion of time you spend on each topic, what's happening in your team and what's happening in those conversations. Everyone loves problems, right? It's practically bike shedding. It's safe to talk about. We can compare lots of stuff. Everyone's got an opinion. It's a very, oddly, a psychologically safe space to talk about problems, right? Of course, I would contend that the place to really look is continue. Those are the things that are really working. Could we do more of that? And they are working now. We don't need to make or change anything for that to go. So we should preserve those. And the starts, they're okay as long as there's a direction, and as long as they're relating to what is wanted or the team have agreed. So a practical example, then a real example, uh, not where I've worked for the last couple of years, uh, I would just highlight. So I'm coaching in an organization with some very senior leaders. They're talking about their team, and this is the sort of stuff I'm hearing. A lot of, uh, they just aren't, they are not, etc., etc. And so I sort of sat back and kind of said, well, look, as a coach, I can't work with that, really. It's incredibly hard to know what you actually want and where you're taking these people. And so I sort of said, could you frame this as a statement of intent? Uh, can you say what you want? And they sort of had a few iterations at this, uh, which is always the way, and that's incredibly valuable, the process of discovering what you're actually interested in. And it basically turned out that what they wanted was to be able to say to these folk, could you do this? And for it to be done, and if there are any problems, they would come and have a conversation. But of course, what they, what they were actually doing was describing a lack of the things that they expected to be happening if it was working. I'm struggling to compete with a disco next door now. Yeah. <laughs> Do we know the tune? Yes, the Rude Sandstorm. <laughs> the Rude Sandstorm, thank you very much. So a question to the organizer, maybe we can tone it down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's yeah, we're all going to want to get up and go next door, right? Uh, so in time to Derude then, uh, have you seen a New Year's party where they set off the fireworks in the drop in this track? It's just fantastic. <laughs> um, 
Now, where was I? Anyone remember what the talk was about? Um, so I invited them then to stop describing what they didn't want and to describe what they did want. Uh, and that helped them coalesce on what they wanted. And then we were able to find more practical things. We were also then able to start to measure it and talk more about performance. If we start to talk about performance in task, we're really moving away from personal attributes. We're moving away from um, a position of deficit where it's the person's problem towards how can we create an environment for performance? How can we get this thing done? And to some extent, what is the influence of the leaders in doing that? Let me give you another example. Uh, this is an exercise you can try with your teams, right? It's physical exercise, I'm afraid it's not remote. Uh, get your team, go to a station, try asking for, a, try to get a ticket for a destination without naming where you want to go. Okay? So, you might start off by saying, well, I don't want to go to Reading because it's got those huge frightening escalators. You might say, uh, I don't want to go to Penryn because it's almost at the beach but not quite there. Uh, and it's got no facilities. You know, it's not going to help you. Uh, the other interesting thing is that uh, were you to do this, you might learn another aspect of not having a direction, which is that someone will tend to find one for you. And in that case, it's likely to be security taking you out of the station. <laughs> so do try this. Let me know how you get along. Uh, a simpler example. Get this in your head. Everyone remember it, the ting tings? Right. Enjoy your earworm. Wouldn't it have been easier if she told us her name? <laughs> Thank you. So, the really serious point in all of that, you know, talk about what you want, not what you don't. Uh, the other thing we think about a lot is uh, what's going on in between, the, the co-creation. So, anyone scan this for what's going on with the body language? Um, Potentially. Yes? Anything else? There's, there's an offer from one of them as well. Yeah. The point is we don't actually know. So these are all good guesses. These are all guesses that I would make as well. But, <laughs> but actually, we don't know. So what we try and encourage ourselves to do is to stay on the surface and work with what, work with what is there. Let's talk about what we've actually seen. Let's talk about the behaviours. Let's talk about what's been said. This is the risk, right? Especially when you come to a conference like this, you inherit all these brilliant words, all these brilliant, brilliant things. There's a risk of psychologically profiling everyone, right? The more I learn about psychology, the more I learn about coaching, the more I realize how unlikely I am to be able to guess what someone's thinking. So I don't. The other thing about in between is this notion of co-creating things, right? So I'm sure you've all heard of the concept of aligned autonomy. And autonomy is one of those really odd words that is often done to people. But actually, it's co-created. And so we work in between to figure out what autonomy means to a team, to a couple of people. And, you know, you, you call it delegation if you like, right? You know, the, the, the opposite end of autonomy is kind of neglect, right? And we don't want to be in that situation. The other end of it is far too much control. So we work in between and we figure out how to craft an agreement or an understanding that is enough to move forward with. The other angle to it is more about systems. This is a pretty common thing you see in performance reviews. You get invited in as a coach to sort of talk about underperformance or improved performance. The ask is often about the individual as if a person on their own can make a huge difference to an organization. There are some that can. But all of this is going on in the background, right? So from a systemic point of view, what we're doing is we're recognizing a person's place in an environment. If you like words like socio-technical system, they're in that, and it is shaping their behavior to some extent. And so we try to recognize that, and we try to recognize the impact of the system and think about the interface just the interface with the system and how it could be changed to make things different. There's a lot going on there. Um, yeah, the other, the other point I was going to make, right, is that I think there's a thing you don't often consider perhaps with coaching and all the stuff that you do when you're championing the cause or trying to encourage someone to behave in a certain way for whatever your joined up goals are, 
is that um, you're kind of coaching the system as well. You're making tiny, tiny changes to the system around you. And of course, if enough coaching is going on and enough of it is aligned, the system is slowly changing. It's often so intangible that you can't really see anything about it, right? So little tiny changes come from good coaching. How are we doing so far? Are we all right? Still here? Thank you for getting the music stopped, by the way. Oh, I, I, I went up to the door and uh, it stopped, but I didn't want to let one open. So I didn't actually do anything. You did, you did. <laughs> they were listening for your footsteps, <laughs> did you? <laughs> so make use of what's there is another principle. And it does relate to the Assumption Club that you saw earlier, in the sense that let's try and use what we have, what's already in the bag, that we've already invested in, uh, rather than trying to change everything for some myth mythical future state. Uh, so you always remember your first Doctor Who, right? I don't know if people remember this, and I'm not doing a show of hands because I think I'd be devastated. But <laughs> the point is, Doctor Who is great at this, right? Even when faced with a giant bubble wrap monster which was attacking his friends, he was able to go around and find things, right? He's great at uh, exploiting situations and spotting things. Uh, and this is a brilliant trait to develop, right? Both in work life and other lives. So we have a, we call these counters. They're things that count towards success. And in our problem focused lives and in our sort of often problem focused upbringing in careers, we're very used to thinking about what's wrong. And that muscle is like overdeveloped. It's like being sort of lopsided in terms of development of thinking about what is wrong, what is not working. But actually, there's a ton of things, I can almost guarantee it, that are working really well in your lives, in your organizations, that you're not noticing, that you could build on and make more of. So Doctor Who is the expert in this then. You can look at things in your past, your present, and ultimately your future. Your future is about uh, possibilities and priming for success. Um, there's a lot about cross-discipline uh, counters and things that will help you. So I quite often talk to people about uh, the tricky work situation, what's going on there. Stop thinking about work for a minute, take a break. Is this similar to anything else? Where have you been successful? Classic things are bringing in when they did sports or went to the gym or you know, uh, wrote, wrote some academic thing or challenged themselves to write a really hard blog post. There was nothing to do with work, but we can immediately see usable, transferable skills, right? The pattern of activity, the time they concentrated well, the time they trained or built good habits, all of that can come straight into work and kind of vice versa as well, right? Okay, so let's talk about some possibilities while I do a time check. Yep, terribly behind, it's traditional. Um, possibilities and possibilities are very important, sense of possibility. This is like the long game of coaching, I guess. Um, it's sometimes called stretching the world. Uh, Mark McCurgo's written about this extensively. Um, I have a blog post about it as well, because I just sort of went on a bit of a rabbit hole about it, because it's so interesting. So the long game of coaching then is uh, really that across multiple sessions, and again, across multiple conversations with any of you in a non-coaching setting, someone may well develop new and interesting and useful thinking habits and thinking styles, right? So we tend to think in quite an insular, this is one conversation, it's about getting better at a task, and it is entirely different to the next one we have in two weeks' time. So your one-to-ones, if you do one-to-ones, or if you, you're looking after a junior or just chatting to someone who, in your team, they're not isolated, right? And over time, they can introduce new ways of thinking and thinking styles. And this is called stretching or stretching the world. Very close to the analogy of whatever animal this is, stretching out its muscles, you know, over time, uh, the stretch becomes more comfortable or more likely to happen. So let me see if we can stretch the world a little bit for you folks. Uh, so coaches who haven't seen this before, uh, what is this? What is this for? Moving stuff, great. Any more? And it's been used for cement. Cement, moving specific stuff. Was there one over here? It's a force multiplier. It's a force multiplier. Nice. <laughs> Thank you, science guy. Uh, okay, brilliant. A couple more, if we can. It's how you deal with infection. 
how you deal with inflation. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Can anyone follow that? <laughs> right. What it's for is all of those things, right? These are all possibilities for, if I use some jargon, this wheelbarrow. These are the things that I found it's for. It's for decorative purposes, right? You can grow flowers in it. Uh, it's an art piece. This is an etched wheelbarrow. The other thing I'm sure you all saw coming is that you can use it for this. <laughs> these are all... <laughs> These are all possibilities, right? And I hope I stretched your world slightly by alerting you to the possibility that you could go home and do any of these if you have a wheelbarrow, or encourage your teams to. This is stretching the world, right? Uh, James Gibson's written some brilliant papers about this. Uh, he calls them affordances, the field of affordances, or range of affordances. It's the range of interactions that we have with a thing, including a system. Um, he says the affordances of the environment are what it offers an animal, what it provides or furnishes for good or ill, right? And so particularly uh, when we're in work mode, when we're highly focused, when there's lots of pressure or we're tired or, you know, a bit depleted or even burning out, our fields of affordance is narrow. We can see less things, okay? And so some of what we try to do with this coaching approach is to just ask for more and for different thinking to encourage a sense of possibility and to look for more possibilities. A really simple way you can do this is uh, if, if someone's chatting to you and they, they want more options or they're interested in options, get the first ones off their head and then just say, do you have one more? I think you have one more, right? And after a while, if they generally come up with three options, if you do that a few times, there's a reasonable chance they'll start to come up with four or five. And then, you know, if they really run with it, they may come up with so many, you have to tell them to time out. But you know, that's what it's about. So sense of possibility, so you're stretching the world. The other thing I like about James is he says this, the verb to afford is found in the dictionary, the noun affordant is, is not, I made it up. And that is some refreshing honesty from an ac academic. Um, now, do I have time to do this bit? I might do. Um, yeah, so just briefly then, if you think about your roles, uh, you're often specializing to find different affordances and different ways to interact with things. Like an entrepreneur is highly specialized towards spotting opportunities that really uh, other people don't notice and then capitalizing on them. The next thing we think about is language. Uh, this is one I found really hard. I love long words. Uh, I love archaic words, sort of the way they roll off the tongue. You know, I can go to, go to see Hamlet and come out speaking Shakespeare practically. Which is pretty annoying. Uh, but what we say for solution focus is to keep it simple, to watch your language, and to really think about the words you're using. So, uh, let's go here first. So, some of it is about using words to describe what we want and to create a very clear and concise picture. And again, you can co create that if you're working with someone who is unsure how to proceed with something, lots of options. Uh, uncertain about their direction, you know, really uh, invite them to talk in simple terms about what they want. The ideal is to use uh, lots of simple words rather than single, complicated, jargon type words. And those words then, if we were to describe what it's like at the top of that hill, let's say that's where we want to go, that's our direction, uh, in imagining that, we increase our motivation towards it. We start to feel like what it might be like to attain the goal. And in so doing, we can start to think about what might help us get there and it feels more worth it. So language, simple language, is extraordinarily helpful for that. The other thing, as I said, is jargon words, right? Long words. This is uh, Anthony Grant, who's a solution-focused uh, practitioner. When he's in academic mode, he says this sort of thing which is pretty much what I've said to you. You don't need to read it all. Um, but the, the bit at the end that's highlighted, right? Problem disengagement is vital for full engagement in the goal pursuit process central to the solution-focused endeavor. What he means is, think about solutions, not problems. But that's taken quite a lot of words. So, simple language. I'll give you a practical example of this, again, from a leadership team. Um, 
I doubt it will resonate, but I'll try it anyway. So imagine you're, you're in your workplace and the product people are arguing with engineering about the backlog. <laughs> yeah, I knew, I'm going out on a limb here. All right, <laughs> just bit, walk with me, pretend that happens, right? And it's getting pretty ferocious and I sort of sat back watching these, you know, talented, bright people arguing about and, and you know, sort of idly jotting up the, the, the money value that's in the room. Yeah, that's an expensive conversation. So it's really hard to outsmart these people. Sometimes you can outdumb them. So what I said was, can we just go around the room and define what we mean by the backlog? And they looked at me like I was a crazy person, which luckily is a feeling I'm quite familiar with. <laughs> and then they said, right, so product said, well, the backlog is a list ordered by business value. The engineering people said, the backlog is a list in pull order. It's the order of execution of work. <coughs> so what we can immediately see then is that it's very hard to order a single list by two different schemes, by two different regimes, right? By explaining that word that we all take for granted out loud using simple words, they are able to expose you know, the core of their disagreement and move on. And you might try that. If you sense this going on, uh, or you sense that you're unsure about something, what do we mean by X? What do I mean by X? Classic areas for this, feedback is a good one, autonomy, uh, backlog, any of our jargon things, right? And then we can also use it to explore purpose. What is the purpose of a stand-up? You're saying that stand-up wasn't good. What is the purpose of a stand-up? Simple words, and away we go. The final thing we believe in uh, is that every case is different, right? Every situation, every organization, every person is different, so it's very hard to generalize. You know, this is the, the thing that really gets me, right? Why can we fit everything into a quadrant? Surely that's not the natural order of things. Surely it's not. I'm very pleased with this, by the way. Thank you for noticing. So we do this all the time, right? And they are informative, but we also assume they tend to assume they're true, and we tend to assume that they hold in all situations, right? And the fact that everything boils down to just four things, I don't know, statistically, that doesn't feel right. Um, I'll just wait until people have stopped whatever they're up to with their phones. But we are a bit terrible at this in Agile, right? There's all these frameworks. One of my favorite phrases is, they're all good, but they can't all work at once. Uh, we, tend to, we tend to treat these as blueprints or things that will definitely work in our organizations. I mean, I don't know the last time you picked up a book on any of these, you flip to the back and it turns out there's something about how to apply that in your organization, in your team, on that exact day with you. Has that happened to anyone? Probably not. That's the danger of it, right? These have worked well for people in certain situations and if you happen to be in a very similar situation, they may well work well, or they might not. And the risk is we'll spend all of our time trying to turn ourselves into something we're not, trying to turn the organization into something it isn't, and in so doing, we'll throw away all the stuff that didn't work. There's a Conway's Law angle here, right? We'll throw away all our communication structures, which might not be as good as we would like, but they're still there. And we'll do Conway's Law by proxy and just inherit someone else's communication structures, right? So we think every case is different then. Um, and I don't want to be disingenuous about this stuff because it is often very useful for starting conversations and sort of focusing attention. But we just have to be careful to consider how far it can go in the unique context that we're in. All right, we're in the home stretch, you'll be pleased to hear. Uh, well, thank you for coming to my talk, which is about this, and I'm not gonna try and pronounce it again. Uh, we talked about simple, right? We talked about this acronym. There were solutions, not problems, so put your focus on where you want, what you want and your direction, and not so much what is wrong and what is wanted. Uh, I might leave it here, just so everyone puts their phones down. Uh, and we talked about in between, right? Remember that, that point about the interaction, right? Work with what's on the surface, but also think about the interactional view, those important things about how we go about life that are co-created and require discussion and negotiation. Possibilities, a sense of possibility, a sense that we can go in the direction we want, 
and get the things that we want. Uh, and a sense of confidence that we can do that, that helps generate ideas. Uh, language, simple words. We talk about uh, $5 words, not 5,000, right? Uh, we are generally paid and rewarded for bringing people along with us and getting things done. And hiding behind ambiguous, long jargon won't necessarily do that. You know, the other thing I'd point out is actually simple words are very inclusive. You know, they tend to be far more effective for people uh, who are familiar with different languages and for people that are new to a field or, or indeed a group, right? You know, even your little uh, in-jokes and things like that. You know, I mentioned Conway's Law and just assumed that everyone had heard of it, right? And that's, that's not inclusive. So your simple language is also inclusive. Every case is different, as we said at the end then. So uh, those of you who are experienced or do sort of similar things, you may well go into pattern recognition mode and assume that this case is the same as the last one you handled that looks superficially similar. You might be right, you might have a great intuition, but the thing is to come in from a standpoint of curiosity and try and establish what's going on before just going into sort of um, auto mode and just thinking, right, that's the same thing, so I'm going to apply this. It's a key principle of finding what works, doing more of it, so amplifying. Um, this is important too, right? You know, I talked about the stance and how you show up in these conversations. Uh, the belief that everyone is whole and doesn't need fixing, and they're all great as they are, and it's just about working together to try and get some things done, it's pretty liberating, actually. It takes you out of analysis and problem-solving mode and makes it much more about how you work together than about what's going on in someone else's head, which you can't see. It's quite a serious point as well here about... Um, this is Cloud Cuckoo Land from the Lego movie, by the way, if you want another earworm and annoying song in your head. We don't live here, okay? I don't want you to think that uh, because of all this, we believe anyone could do anything at any time uh, and that we should encourage them to do that. It's not about sort of trite statements and, you know, these posters with eagles soaring around the place, right? We're realistic in this and we are simply looking for what will work in the situation. You know, I have said that a lot, and that's because it's so important. So there's no false hope here. We're working with what's there. Um, I might skip that one. You know, a, a very real example of this, and I guess often what we're dealing with in, our, in our, our agile practices and in our lives are things that are less tangible than the challenges that people like this face. Um, you know, in the Invictus Games and, and paraplegics and so forth. Terrible situations. But where are their thoughts going? Well, they're not focused on how to solve the problem necessarily. The, some of these problems are unsolvable, right? What they're doing is they're focusing on solutions. How can I play sport? What sport can I play? And so are all the teams that support them, right? The sense of possibility, the sense of knowing what is wanted and going towards that, rather than always looking in the rearview mirror and saying, oh, I wish I had X. And this is a serious point to this talk, really. That's my invite to you, to try and spread that, to try and bring that to yourself, try and bring that to the people around you, sense of possibility, help to form direction, and then you'll be able to find things that will help you walk towards it. I'll leave you with this final quote from someone who's been rather successful at this. Uh, Venus Williams, I don't focus on what I'm up against. I focus on my goals, and I'll try to ignore the rest. And that's it. Thank you for coming along. Absolutely wonderful, John. Thank you so much. A very timely quote with Wimbledon on at the moment. Uh, any questions for John? Questions, questions. Any questions? Well, if there aren't any questions, is there anything that you'd like me to elaborate on or that you felt wasn't clear? I have a question. I don't know if it's entirely relevant. Quite well. Oh, thank you. Hi. Um, uh, so I do a lot of one-to-one -one coaching, but it's um, I, I very often go into teams where it's it's not the person approaching you for a coaching session and trying to find a goal. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm just in having one-to-ones with individual people within a team, and I find it quite difficult sometimes to create a real sense of safety for them to share. Sometimes it's a cultural thing. Some of them are outside the business, and and I do always sort of try and. Um, uh, 
frame it as if you're raising something to me, I might have to action it, but it will always be actioned as the team have raised this. So it's so not one person is accountable. Um, I, I've tried so many exercises to try and provide that safety for them to, 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 to be as forthcoming as, as, as they, as they need to be, but still not always getting back, um, you know, the, the, the best results. Do you have any advice for creating that safety in a, in a one-to-one coaching session? So there's, there's, there's quite a lot in that, you know, it's a perennial problem. Um, I wonder if you would mind just trying to demonstrate what we just talked about and shape that up into what you want. Like an I want, because there's, you've described a number of things for the person that you're talking to, a number of things that might be a little bit more to do with you. Basically, I want people to trust me. Well, perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Right. Okay. So, so now we have something to work with together. So you want people to trust you so that you can effectively enable them to do their thing uh, and so that you can feel comfortable, I'm guessing, uh, with what you're doing. Okay. So the first thing is there's no quick fix for that, right? Uh, have you seen the trust equation? Because that's a great thing to work through. Uh, part of that is is about doing what you say you'll do. Um, you can use some of these techniques to uh, work out with the person what they're interested in. And then if you're able to deliver on some of that, you're likely to develop the trust there. Um, I feel like it's almost too big to answer Sorry, yeah, no. I, know, that, I did preface it by... Yeah, you did, you did, and it was wonderful. Um, shall we try and talk afterwards? Sure. And we'll see if there's anything a little bit more anchored to what we've been talking about just Thank now. Thank you. Okay, well, I think that's, that's everything. So John's going to be around the break, I think. Oh, um, yes. We have got a break until uh, quarter past and then uh, the final keynote. So um, thank you for coming to the team working stream. It's been a delight and have a great rest of, rest of the event and enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye.